Hey there, and welcome to the Heroes of Marketing Cloud, the show where I interview experts in Salesforce Marketing Cloud. I'm your host, I'm Anthony, the CEO and co-founder of Deselect. Today on the show, I have with me Aaron Beatty. Aaron um, has been active in the marketing cloud industry for a decade. We talk about his new firm that he created, Engage Evolution. We also talk about how Spring does one-on-one -on -one email personalization, something that Aaron was involved in. Talk about data cloud, AI, and also some advice for new Salesforce Marketing Cloud customers. Welcome to the show. Hey, uh, super happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's uh, absolutely a pleasure. Um, it's been a few months now, a few weeks now since we saw each other at Dreamforce. I was very happy mm -hmm. to have been able to meet you face to face and I'm very excited to have you here today. Um, for, for our audience sake, can you tell us a bit about yourself, your background, and ultimately what led you to found Engage Evolution? Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to do my best to give the cliff notes. Otherwise, you know, I don't know how much time we have for the, uh, for the podcast, but I have a tendency to go into way too much detail. So, um, <laughs> I, uh, I will give you the, the quick background, which is that I started in aerospace engineering. I worked for Northrop Grumman on the C-17, uh, Globemaster three aircraft for a while. Then I switched into professional theater which, you know, is a natural jump for most of people to go from aerospace engineering to professional theater. I um, heard about but, that. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, doing that, though, I was a, a master scenic carpenter and a house manager. And um, then I did some time in retail. Um, I worked for Apple for um, about eight years. And then uh, once I was ready to start a family, uh, it was time to find something uh, that was a little more friendly to that. And that's when I started learning about Exact Target and later Salesforce Marketing Cloud. And so that was in, in 2012. Um, and so over a decade now, I think I get to say, uh, I've been working on that and learning it and, uh, you know, kind of went through the ropes of that. So building emails and, and testing and campaign management and support and documentation and all the other things that are part of of that uh, ecosystem. And uh, I've just kind of been working my way up the ladder uh, for a while. And uh, my last position was as a director of a um, of a group of a Salesforce Marketing Cloud practice. And um, ultimately I got, I guess I would say frustrated that uh, sometimes it feels like the larger an organization gets, the, the more it stops listening to their people, starts, stops listening to their customers and it starts to feel like a Herculean effort to try to get anything done or to try to get things changed from how they always were. And so ultimately those frustrations led me to feel like I had no other choice but to start my own Salesforce marketing cloud uh, practice. And so that's what happened in February of this year. And um, so I've been, been doing that ever since. And, uh, not a not a huge length of time there, but uh, things seem to be going well, and and um, and I'm really enjoying it. What a background! I uh, would love <laughs> to further explore what you're currently doing, but there were a few things you said that I thought were interesting. So, it continues to amaze me how much of a variation there is amongst marketing automation professionals. In fact, a few mm -hmm. interviews ago, I interviewed one of our own. Uh, Eduardo, uh, who leads our customer success team, and he mm -hmm. originally started his career programming satellites. Oh wow! Yeah. Yeah. And so the the um, <laughs> I almost think also that having that variety, for sure, the real life experience helps. I think for any marketing experience, yeah. but sometimes just having worked in these uh, very um, technical industries can definitely set you on the right track to deal with marketing automation because it's so complex. Yeah, yeah, it 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 is and and definitely can be. I I think for me my background, you know, I can look at every job that I've had and pick out little things, you know, that I picked up, you know, while I was in engineering, little things I picked up when I was in retail and and sales and uh and a bunch of things while I was at Apple. Um and that's impacted how I how I run my own company. It's impacted how I treat customers and colleagues. Um and it and it it ultimately changes what I look for in a Salesforce marketing cloud uh, employee too. Like what, what am I looking for from, from people that I want to join my company as we grow? Um, it's all influenced by, by that background, but yeah, everybody's, there's not a, I mean, there probably is now a digital marketing or marketing automation degree. Um, but, uh, 
uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't go through anything even close to that. <laughs> Are you ever able to tap into your experience as a master scenic carpenter when you're back uh, working for a theater? Mm. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose if I, if I really wanted to, I, you know, my, my parents at one point wanted me, me to be an architect and I was never really that interested in that. And then I got into building sets and stuff like that and being a master scenic carpenter and, you know, what you do there, I'm, I'm not necessarily coming up with what the set's going to look like. There's a designer for that. Um, but, but then they give you some crazy thing to build and you've got to figure out, you know, the structures that are maybe behind the scenes, um, and you know, how it's all going to fit together and still manage to, uh, support an actor's weight or, you know, not hurt somebody when they're on stage, you know, lost in their character and, and not paying attention to how fragile that set piece may or may not be. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so there's a, there's, I suppose some of that, uh, in that, you know, in, in my job now, it's, it's the same kind of thing, you know, a designer or a client will come and say, here's the finished thing that I want. Uh, but we have no idea how to get there. And so, much like an architect or a scenic, uh, you know, carpenter, you're kind of figuring out the behind the scenes elements and, and the, the data architecture and the data structures that are supporting that end piece. Um, so, um, and hopefully when you're done, it's not fragile and it's sustainable and it's scalable, um, just like you would want from, you know, a scenic piece in a theater. I love how you meticulously broke that down and and brought the uh, <laughs> abstraction layer that uh, uh, that pro provides some similarity between something as varied as uh, being a carpenter in a theater industry. Yeah, and <laughs> marketing. Yeah, there's. I'm, I mean, the only difference is I'm not using uh, any trig or anything like that. Um, that's that's just reserved for when I'm helping my 13 year old with her homework, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, everything else, you know, I haven't had to touch that kind of stuff as part of the, uh, there's very little map, although, you know, starting to get into AI and, and, and language models and, and there's a ton of math, um, and, uh, calculations involved in that. So who knows, um, I may have to start picking that up too. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I was going to ask for engage evolution, the, the company you started relatively recently, um, mm -hmm. Do you already have a sense of this is going to be your focus, whether it's functionally what you want to do in marketing cloud, or maybe a focus in terms of types of customer you want to serve? Do you have a, mm -hmm. an idea already what your ICP is and so on? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we are, we are founded as a Salesforce marketing cloud partner and really focused in on that whole suite of software. So, um, you know, that, that will, I'm sure change. And, you know, if we leave it up to Salesforce, I'm sure it will change names another three or four times just in the next year. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, so that's, you know, what used to be Pardot, what used to be exact target, uh, you know, and data cloud and all the other pieces that are part of quote unquote marketing cloud is, is where we focus. And, and as far as verticals, I got a lot of advice when I started that I really needed to focus in on a vertical, like pick, pick your lane. And, um, and I felt like that was good advice and also really difficult advice, um, to follow, um, because I have, uh, a lot of friends working in a lot of different industries and I'd like to be able to help them out kind of wherever they are. And mm -hmm. if they're using marketing cloud, odds are I have some kind of insight or best practices into at least what I think they should be doing with their platform. And, um, so, you know, right out of the gate, I had, you know, financial services clients, I had nonprofit, I had some commercial and, um, you know, as long as you can speak the language of those different verticals, the solutions, um, can have a lot of similarities. It's just the, the kind of code switching you're using in your language to discuss it. So are you talking yeah. about subscribers? Are you talking about constituents? Are you talking about fundraising? Are you talking about development? Are you talking about sales? And there's a ton of overlap on all those different kind of um, code words that those different industries use. But at the end of the day, you know, the solutions in marketing cloud are going to be largely, you know, based on the same structures and, and platform capabilities that you have on any vertical. So um, 
that's a long-winded way to say no. Uh, I, <laughs> I haven't really, I haven't really um, landed on a single uh, a vertical. And uh, you know, as a, as a startup, it's you know, it's going to be hard for me to say no if somebody wants my help because they're sure. in, you know, not my core vertical or whatever. So that's no, kind of uh, how it's played out so far. And vertical could have been part of ICP, but but I also know there are some who have an affinity for a certain segment like uh, enterprise, mm -hmm. mid market. So um, that's also oh yeah, that else. too. Yeah, and and you know, it tends to be, I guess, smaller um, and and more mid market. But um, you know, we have a couple of pretty large, pretty large clients with some pretty complex setups, um, and. You know, a lot of times the solutions are still kind of the same. I mean, the 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 focus, you know, is always going to be in terms of at least in terms of marketing cloud, like how do you set this thing up in such a way that the, you know, it, perhaps just a marketer like a like a business user is able to get in there and get what they need without needing to be able to write SQL or um, you know, do other things that that is not in most marketers' bag of tricks. Um, and so, you know, there's, yeah. as, as you know, there's a variety of products out there that help with, uh, with those kinds of things and services that help with that kind of thing. But it's also from how you, you structure and architect the entire solution has to be, um, I think from that point of view first, um, how do you make it easy to use, uh, because of the inherent complexity, uh, in the, in the platform. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, although I will say I'm grateful for that complexity. If not for it, I would, our company would probably not exist. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. But, but yeah. jokes aside, uh, uh, we have. I mean, I, I understand. I really, it really resonated when you said there are code words for certain industries. Yeah. So, for instance, when we talk with insurance companies, they'll be more, you know, more likely to be talking about whether it's um, a direct model, an indirect model, uh, cross sells of policies. Um, mm -hmm. um, whereas if you talk with maybe higher education, you're talking about advancement programs. But mm -hmm. ultimately, what we do, for instance, is a, is a horizontal, and it's just finding those code words and relating to it. And I almost feel sometimes that, um, and this might be interesting for those who are listening, who are considering or already partnering with Salesforce. Um, when you're partnering with Salesforce, there's a lot of guidance on uh, being vertical specific. However, I feel that's more because that suits Salesforce very well because they're at this scale. If they want right. to significantly capture TAM, they have to have that whole super uh, vertical focus, uh, specific narrative. Um, and that sometimes doesn't make sense for other companies who are truly horizontal or mm -hmm. you know aren't even at a scale to have uh, a strong vertical specific motion. Right. Yeah, it's... I mean, I, yeah, I think in some ways it's it's partly due to just how Salesforce is structured. Um, you know, their their account execs and you know the people that work there, they have you know different uh, verticals that they work in and different size uh, and scales that they work in, um, and it's helpful that way. And then I think I think clients and customers also kind of um, force force the conversation into that as well. For, for better and I think sometimes for worse, because, you know, if I, let's say I work for a nonprofit and I'm looking for a tool to do forms, for example, uh, I am in my, you know, we're looking at like SEO type stuff and I'm looking for a, a product that does that. I'm not going to look for the best form product out there. I'm going to look for a nonprofit focused uh, form. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, probably unnecessarily limiting in some ways um, because you're looking, you know, specifically for your vertical under the assumption that it needs to be specific to your vertical or might have different tools or functionality. Um, and, and I think too, that clients want, they kind of want to know that you have a solution that's just for them. Um, and so saying, oh, well, you know, sales is pretty close to uh, to a nonprofit that's trying to get donations, you know, or something like that. There, there is a lot of similarity in that. Um, just like there's a but lot of they similarity might see in it that way. <laughs> well, exactly. No, they don't. And and higher ed is the same. Like thinking of higher ed in the context of sales uh, and in the context of trying to convince potential students to come to your college or university. I mean, that is 
it is sales um, that, you know, they don't want to think of it that way. But so there's a lot of, of cross vertical and cross um, cross industry expertise that I think is uh, going to waste maybe a little bit or not paid attention to just because it's not specific to that uh, vertical. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, part of, you know, working on the, the consulting side of it is learning to do the code switching so that when you speak to those things, you can translate it into their language. And then they, they hear those code words and they go, oh, okay, they, they understand what we do. Um, and then, and then you can have a meaningful conversation from there. Yeah. It certainly is a great way to build report. Um, mm -hmm. Aaron, you've, as you mentioned, um, have had about a decade of experience with marketing cloud. If you think back of the many projects you've done, um, can you think back of what was your favorite or one of, of or one of your favorite projects and why? Mm, yeah. Um, there's a few that come to mind. I'm trying not to let like a recency effect here impact my answer because I just found some exciting solutions uh, for <laughs> for a client that that was a lot of fun. But oh, I think that's, overall, that's fine if you talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go with um, I uh, I worked with uh, Teespring a, a while ago, um, and they uh, they've kind of morphed their business since since I worked with them. But but at the time, they really were just kind of a custom T-shirt print shop, and um, and now actually they've changed names. I think they're just spring now, but anyway, uh, their request was they wanted an email that could go out that would be personalized for people. And so what we ended up doing is writing a lot of AMP script, um, which is, as you know, the, you know, native, one of the native languages for marketing cloud. Um, and then I think there was some SQL involved behind the scenes, but basically it was an email that sent each person their own unique email and it would populate the email with the top selling t-shirts of the different categories from which they had most often purchased. And so um, each person that received an email was going to get their own unique email, um, not even like based on a segment. It was really kind of a one-to-one -one thing just based on um, having access to the catalog and then having access to purchase data and then having access to the you know most popular uh, shirts that we're selling. So that was a really, that was a really fun one. And, uh, one of those that was like lots of late nights, um, trying to get the email to do the thing. And then finally at like four in the morning, you get the thing to, to populate correctly. And it's just, you know, it's amazing when you get to show the client the next day, kind of a thing. So, um, that was really fun. And, um, really most of the really fun projects that I've had have been along those lines in, kind of figuring out how to how to increase segmentation and get closer to having a one-to-one -one, mm -hmm. uh, experience on the email versus saying you are one of you know 200,000 people in the segment um, to really treat each person as an individual based on their data and that's um, that's been kind of the holy grail in in email marketing and also something that's been ridiculously difficult to do Oh, I can imagine. And by the way, I can confirm that uh, Teespring has been renamed Spring. I just looked it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a cool brand. And, and, and mm -hmm. it sounded like you really, you reached or at least approximated very closely a one-to-one -one communication. I suppose maybe mm -hmm. people who, who did similar, you know, purchases and similar product categories uh, with that brand, they might have um, still gotten somewhat similar recommendations, if not the same. Um, mm -hmm. But uh share with us like why uh why were the all-nighters necessary so what were the bottlenecks in getting to that <laughs> of one of one-on-one -on -one communication i i think it's it, probably part of that is just my um you know i feel like there's probably a bit of imposter syndrome there and that when i go to develop or build something i feel like well you know i'm i'm like a junior developer like a junior engineer like I, I can get by, I can make it work, but it tends to be a lot of trial and error. Like, you know, you write the code and, and it comes close, it almost does it, or it just gives you error after error. And you just can't get to the point where it's actually, um, you know, making it all the way through and displaying a preview <laughs> properly. Yeah. So, 
Um, so I think it's, I think for me, it's a lot of that and, and, and who knows, you know, maybe your most experienced engineers and developers, um, are exactly the same way, but I, I envision somebody in my mind's eye, like a really experienced developer, just sitting down and just from their brain directly into the, into the code and they just write the exact code and then they hit, you know, send and it's perfect. Like that's in my brain, that's, that's how somebody that really knows what they're doing um, would do it. And for me, it's lots and lots of trial and error. And so that, that ends up being late nights working on stuff. And by the way, not working late because it's uh, there's like a deadline that needs to be hit, but mostly because um, I'm like in the zone, you know, like I'm, I'm making oh, yeah. progress. I'm really close to getting it and I'm having fun doing it. And so I lose track of time and then I look up and I'm going, oh, it's time for my daughter to wake up and get on the bus or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's more, it's more from that, just like being like really focused in on something until you, um, until you crack it. Oh, no, I definitely recognize that feeling. Um, I don't do any coding anymore these days, but in the early days for D-Select even, I, I did. And um, it, it's definitely a good medium to enter that state of flow, as psychologists mm -hmm. would call it. Um, and I do think, by the way, as a, as a you know, um, a little side note, I do think even the best engineers have to do this kind of trial and error or something just oh, yeah. To yeah, sure. that works organic. I don't think anyone can just you know, A to Z type out a whole piece of functional code that will be probably like a freak of a person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. But what I've always found helpful is to, um, rather than just starting to come up with a good architecture, break down functionality into modules and then work my way through those modules. And and when you destructure mm -hmm. it like that, then um, there's a lot less frustration and, and iterations afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I'm not always as good at doing that, but I definitely have a smoother workflow when I, when I have a properly documented plan with requirements and, you know, goals and, you know, pseudocode um, prior to just kind of hopping in um, and then, you know, saving early and often and saving iterations of, of code so that I can go back a step or two if I need to, or if I break something. Um, I, I'm just not always as, as good at being that organized. And sometimes I just want to hop in and get my hands dirty. <laughs> sure. Well, I still love to stay with this example of this um, project a little bit longer because I'm kind of curious what kind mm -hmm. what what does a data architecture look like? Because I'm trying to sort of imagine what do you need to do a communication like that? So presumably mm -hmm. you need to store per customer their most favorite product categories so that is based on purchase data maybe with some mm -hmm. sql that updates into a mm -hmm. table but then you want to personalize based on the layered product so do you load a product catalog and does that is that linked to a content yeah yeah so i mean i think i think you i think you kind of talked it out there so it's it's largely that so the the main thing that you need is is a product catalog um, and you know, if that catalog has, you know, predefined categories, um, so like in their, in their implementation, I think they had like, you know, there's like patriotic t-shirts, there are like music t-shirts, there are t-shirts by, um, by like keyword. So like, you know, if you search for teacher, you might get, you know, a bunch of t-shirts for, what it's like to be a teacher. And if it's, if you search for engineer, then you might get a bunch of different kind of funny shirts for engineer. So it was a lot of like keyword based, um, uh, products in a product catalog. And then they always had an image, um, that they would show on their website for all the t-shirts. So I had access to all of that. So between that and the, the transactional data, um, that's really it. And then, and then the sequel is just looking for each person, their last X purchases, and then looking at the categories of t-shirts that they purchased, and then trying to, trying to kind of discern their top, you know, however many categories, um, based on whatever it is that we're trying to do. So, um, sometimes you can just use that, um, implicit, um, preference based on what they're purchasing. Um, I have had some situations that are kind of similar to that, where we've been able to combine the transactional, um, 
data along with the preference data from their like preference center and then combine that with their viewing data um, based on like the things that they're looking at on the website and then trying to kind of combine all of that through a, a series of SQL queries or what have you to try to kind of guess the top things that somebody might be interested in. And usually, you know, the longer ago that they did that, the less uh, impact it's going to have on your final scores and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, you can make it as complicated as you want to, but it's usually some semblance of of those pieces of data that you recombine into an email. It's also interesting that you can combine implicit and explicit preferences. And I would wonder mm -hmm. then what actually makes more impact if you would afterwards, if you would like a B test it and see if people respond more to their explicit or implicit preferences. I, I'm going to guess implicit. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Because I think, you know, it's hard to get really granular when you're doing explicit because, you know, you can, you only want to show so many options on your page. Like you wouldn't want, like if we go back to the Teespring example, and let's say they've got a thousand categories of t-shirts, you know, you're not going to have them sift through all thousand categories and say, yeah, I like cowboy merchandise and my wife's a teacher. So I like teacher stuff or, you know, like that's, that's going to be really hard to find, but you might be like, well, they like uh, t-shirts uh, versus hats. So like you might be able to combine the more broad categories with their implicit um, either uh, browsing behavior or uh, abandoned shopping cart type stuff, uh, plus the stuff that they actually bought. Um, and, yeah. and I think the thing that's hard with that to really get right, which probably nobody does is like, when is somebody going to buy something one time for a specific use um, versus that's the thing that they like to buy? You know, like if I'm on if I'm on the home shopping page and I bought uh, a, a set of sheets or something like that, that's probably not going to be something I'm going to buy all the time. It doesn't mean I just love buying sheets. It means I needed a set of sheets. I bought them. Now I'm done with that. I don't want to keep getting emails about my next favorite sheets because I just bought them. So like, it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to, to square those edges and figure out um, what's actually going to make sense in the ultimate email. And that's, I, that's probably impossible to get right um, right now, but uh, you can, you know, kind of take a stab at it. Now for spring, they probably constantly have um, uh, new content available. So how do you make mm -hmm. sure that um, you can actually show the last uh, category winners to to those customers is it integrated with some kind of external CMS or is there like a process of constantly updating the latest image for the coolest new shirts? How does that work? Yeah, I think um, uh, this has been it's been a hot second, um, so I don't I don't remember all the details for them specifically, but but generally speaking, um, you know if we're looking at top products, um, you know it, it's it's likely not going to include anything that's brand new because there needs to be data to support that it's a hot product, meaning enough purchase history or whatever to say, okay, this is a thing that people like. Um, and so uh, it ends up just being, you know, in, in marketing cloud parlance, it ends up being a data extension that's getting updated every, you know, probably day or two um, with the current most popular items of the different categories um and then you take it from there so that's that's at least how that one worked to my recollection all right thanks for sharing well talking about yep. hot products let's uh, shift the conversation a bit to all the stuff we heard at dreamforce um mm -hmm. salesforce has and continues to make uh, major investments in their data cloud that's the name of their cdp formerly mm -hmm. known as genie formerly known as salesforce cdp formerly known as salesforce 360 but um mm -hmm. um where do you ultimately see data cloud going? Um, what do you think about that product category? And um, uh, what do you see in the market? Yeah, I mean, bringing it to, to specifically data cloud or data cloud for marketing, um, I, I think it's definitely where they are wanting to bring the product. I mean, it, it, it certainly seems like they're making a lot of investment into that tool. And... Um, 
I, I hate to say at the expense of like marketing cloud engagement or something like that, but it does kind of seem like a lot of the uh, energy and, you know, the new um, AI based tools and, um, you know, marketing GPT and all that um, it, it, you would expect it, I think, to be in marketing cloud engagement uh, or marketing cloud en account engagement, and instead it's in data cloud. So definitely they're they're making a push uh, to make that platform really attractive um, and, you know, announcing that you can now get what amounts to a free trial of, um, of the data cloud and kind of taking a look at it, basically giving people, uh, you know, their first taste is free. Uh, for that, um, you know, the the downside to that product right now is that it's um, it's not an inexpensive license, um, mm -hmm. and it it at current is really it seems to me like it's m mostly a way to to solve for how difficult it can be in marketing cloud to get segments, and mm -hmm. so it's a uh, it's, it's a way for Salesforce to sell a product, to make that part of, of another one of their products a little easier to use. Um, but they are, you know, rapidly advancing the, the capability of that tool. Um, and I think the, the kind of end user, um, the way that it's being framed is more, you know, you've got your CRM data, but your CRM data isn't everything. You've also got data on the web and you've got data based on your social networks and you've got data from all of your advertising. And so you've got all these pieces of data in addition to CRM and that that's a place where you can bring it all together and create profiles and kind of flatten the data and then um, activate it uh, through journeys or through, um, uh, let's see what it's called now, marketing cloud personalization um, uh, or back into CRM. And so I don't know. I'm I'm really torn on it. I think I think it's going to grow into a thing that's going to be really attractive for folks. But um, but it's a little bit of a hard sell uh, at the moment for at least most of the smaller organizations. It's you know, it's a pretty big lift. Oh, that's that's fair, I think. And um for those more well-versed in the Salesforce ecosystem, we all know that Salesforce's platform really consists of often different infrastructure, different databases because of the acquisitions mm -hmm. it has done over the years. What I do find exciting is that there's going to be what hopefully will become a common ground for all these platforms, which will make integration a lot easier, if not just mm -hmm. completely unnecessary uh, in case of uh, certain capabilities. But but I think we're still some way um, you know, there's there's still some road to be traveled before we get there. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it, it, I think for for those of us that rely on this ecosystem for our um, livelihood, it's it's still an open question for where we should be investing our time and effort, mm -hmm. and you know, training uh, and you know, certifications and all that kind of stuff, like where where are things headed it definitely you know just based on the things that salesforce has been saying it definitely feels like data cloud is one of those areas where you know to your point it's it's a it's a common ground for development and you know the newer stuff is all coming out of that um that uh that same platform so um i think that's where things are headed but man there's just so much uh existing technical structure and debt in all of these other tools that um, for Salesforce as a company, I don't know how they begin to bring all that stuff together, but, um, um, but, but yeah, I think that's, that's going to be an important part of their, their strategy. Absolutely. Another thing we heard a lot about um, at Dreamforce uh, is AI. It was uh, yep. kind of hard to escape that phrase. Uh, you already <laughs> alluded to the phrase earlier at the start of the conversation, although maybe you were, mm -hmm. you were rather referring to your personal use of AI. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely right now. It's it's definitely the buzzword du jour, right? Um, mm -hmm. And um, you know, my standing joke was like, walk around and go, "Who's Al? Why does everybody keep talking about <laughs> Al?" Um, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's inescapable. It's definitely blown up, obviously, in the last year with uh, ChatGPT and then all the other um, tools that have that have come around as a result. Um, I am of the opinion that 
that it's, I think it will get us to a place where we can really do that one-to-one -one marketing engagement. Um, and I think it's really going to expedite um, that transition. It, like I, you know, I referred earlier is the kind of the, the, the holy grail of marketing is to be able to have a, a marketing segment of one uh, and not have to group people together into these giant groups. And so um, the scale of data processing and, and thinking, and I use that term either in the, you know, the, the sense of a human doing it or the sense of an artificial intelligence doing it. But the, with all the tools and capability we've had so far, you just, you don't have the time and resources to, to have a segment of one. So it's a shorthand that you create segments and put people that are similar together under the assumption that they're going to behave roughly similarly. And um, yeah, I think we're just going to be able to get to the point where it's literally just, this is marketing for Aaron Beatty. And it's based on what we know about Aaron Beatty and what we know triggers him and whether he's on his phone on TikTok or Facebook or whether he's on email and um, we know he's taken these steps and these actions and what's going to be the next action that's going to be most likely to get him closer to our goal. And, uh, so I think, I think we're going to get there pretty quick. Um, and that'll be, uh, really, really great from a marketing perspective. And as a consumer perspective, really scary, uh, because, um, as good as marketers are and as good as algorithms are at pushing our buttons, uh, it's just going to get better uh, or worse, <laughs> you know, depending on how you look, at, how it. You look at it. And so, yeah. so yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be really interesting to, to see that happen. And, and from the marketing perspective, be part of making that happen. Have you also personally dabbled a lot with uh, trying out AI tools or tricks with uh, chat GPT? Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely, you know, I alluded earlier to being kind of a, like I, you know, probably imposter syndrome, but just kind of feeling like a junior engineer in some some cases, and and having a tool that can help me proofread, um, that can help me um, write code faster than I can on my own, or faster than I can with a quick Stack Exchange search or Google search, um, it's it's uh it's really beneficial um, from that perspective, um, and then being a uh, a very small company and then having all the responsibilities of, you know, building a website, having support tools, doing, you know, accounting and all the other things that are really just a function of owning a business. Um, there's a lot of help uh, that I can get from, uh, from tools for copywriting, for image creation, for uh, writing outlines for presentations. I mean, on and on and on. Uh, there's there's a ton of of benefit to those tools. Um, and then, you know, even on the project management side, we use internally a tool called uh, Motion uh, mm -hmm. that uses some AI tricks um, to basically manage and organize the tasks that you have due, and putting them on your your calendar based on the time that you have available. So there's some internal uh, like uses of tools like that that are really helpful for time management. And then um, I'm currently taking a class at MIT um, remote for, um, for large language models and AI and kind of how to build your own. And, and one of the things that I'd like to do is to start to build some tools uh, based on all of the documentation that I have, all of our kind of internal wiki best practices and things like that, and seeing if we can build something um, either for internal use or something we could share with our, our client partners and and offer them something that can, uh, where they can look at our kind of database of best practices and pull out the information that they need via one of those tools. So it's amazing, like some kind of a yeah. marketing cloud knowledge base with, mm -hmm. with which you can interact through natural language. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I feel like that's kind of the the first phase of that. I feel like longer term, I think um, I think there is going to be a need to have some tools that will do kind of what I was referring to with the one to one marketing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you take that thought out to its logical conclusion. Um, where 
I have some kind of database, data warehouse, data lake. I get lost in all the terminology, but you have a bunch of data somewhere. And then you have some AI tools that sit on top of that to help you to figure out, um, oh, this cookie was Aaron when he went to this website and this you know, transaction was also Aaron because that's tied to his credit card number and you know, some kind of AI that's making sense of the data. And then maybe an additional layer of AI that sits on that to kind of analyze it from a uh, almost a psychological perspective, like a uh, a human behavior perspective plus marketing. It's just like they did these things. Now they're most likely, you know, kind of getting into generative or predictive AI. Like this is their next most likely thing uh, that either we want them to do to increase profits or we want them to do to donate to our cause or we want them to do to uh, go to our university or, you know, whatever the <laughs> whatever the use case is. Uh, and then to send them uh, a message through whatever channel makes the most sense um, to try to move them, you know, one step closer to that goal. Um, and if you've got a system that can do that, then you don't really need much in the way of an AI. You don't really need much in the way of like a pre-planned journey or automation. It's really just the system kind of looking at each person and seeing if there's any communication we can send the, to them that will increase the odds of them doing what we want them to do. <laughs> awesome. It actually ties in uh, to some stuff we do as well. Um, we are already integrating a bunch of AI capabilities you know, into our product. In fact, for this mm -hmm. segment, um, yeah. we are already in alpha with um, people using natural language to create segments. Uh, mm -hmm. And not just that it generates a SQL, uh, but it's actually, you know, visible in our UI. So also non-technical yeah. users can actually understand what's going on. So it's kind of cool because we also want to integrate speech to text. So soon you'll be able to just shout at your laptop to build a segment. I can't wait to do that. Right. I already do that, actually. It just doesn't listen. It just doesn't uh, listen. So it'll be... <laughs> 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 so that'll be that'll be great. I'll be like, dang it, do this thing. It'll be like, okay, it's done. I'll be like, oh, great. I wasn't expecting. And I can that. see, I can see you go. Why don't you listen? And then it tries to explain very meticulously why it's not listening. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like I have not been programmed to listen. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, but uh, one one thing that that's also interesting to me is um, doing more campaign planning and optimization. Um, mm -hmm. That's what we're doing with with Engage. Too. People are using it now to plan their campaigns, making sure. Uh, uh, their segments are not being um, over engaged with or oversaturated. So right. it's yeah. actually marketing frequency. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, we're now also introducing not generative, but predictive AI there to um, allow people to still set rules, but to also let the system come up with an ideal um, send volume per contact. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. even beyond that, thinking about um, maybe the marketer opens the platform and we can just go, Hey, um, great job on all those campaigns, but did you know this specific audience is, um, underserved and then one, this is, mm -hmm. this, these are their commonalities. And then two, these are recommendations that, that we would give to you to do campaigns around, like do, do a mm -hmm. campaign around this product category, you'll probably have, uh, this kind of, uh, response. So, uh, we're not there yet, but I do think, um, that's a really exciting vision to work towards. And I think that's a bit the future yeah. of marketing. You want to offer this, um, um, mission control center to marketing operations folk um, so they can much faster make decisions and, and, and work out their planning. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think, I think we're just at the, the, uh, the beginning of, of what's going to be available there. Cause if you take, you know, what you just mentioned out as a kind of natural next step, you know, there's already, you know, chat GPT and, and other tools like, you know, mid journey and, and others that can mm -hmm. start to create um, content given a specific tone. And so if you have a, a brand tone or a language that your brand uses, but also you want to make your language unique to the segment that you're speaking with, you know, it's almost like uh, earlier when we were talking about code switching for different, for different verticals, it's kind of the same idea. You could do that for, uh, for your segments too, and still, maintain a brand voice, but have it match who you're trying to talk to. And so uh, you could certainly ask a copywriter to do that. And I'm sure the results would be fabulous. Um, the The challenge is, is the volume of requests 
and the quantity of segments that you might end up having. And so if you have a tool that can assist with that, even if it's a first draft, um, to, to do that and, uh, and kind of go the rest of the way or maybe 80% of the way to generating the actual content and then rely on the human being for the last 20% to make sure that, you know, there's not a crazy, you know, third arm or sixth finger uh, <laughs> on yeah, an yeah. image and, you know, that kind of stuff. And that'll get better with time too. So, um, it's, it's so yeah, I think that. it's, it's going to be amazing. I funny that you mentioned that because uh, what I recently did is, um, um, so in, in our team now, uh, I'm still doing a lot of, um, enablement and, um, a lot of product knowledge still sits with me. So one of the things I, I, and I enjoy doing too, is sort of educating our own team. And, um, since we also want to better speak to those codes, to, to use that same terminology, right. So to have more yeah, vertical yeah. specific language, I started, um, I started this little project where I was, uh, verticalizing some of our internal documentation. So we have very extensive internal documentation on our products, their use cases, awesome. um, and yeah. then how, how that pay, uh, it goes into benefits and ICP and all that good stuff, but I didn't have any industry specific knowledge. So what I did was I opened a new chat GP, uh, GPT session. I, um, I, I pay for the subscription. So I have the 4.0, which is significantly better. It and is. then I just, <laughs> yeah. And I just went to our website and I did copy paste all dumped it into chat GPT. Like, Hey, this is what we do. Read the website and it just reads it. And then mm -hmm. I said, okay, now try to think of typical use cases for marketing operations uh, in insurance. And so then I, okay. And I, I do a little bit of fact check. Like, does it make sense? Does it understand what I'm trying to do? Okay. Now merge merge mm -hmm. what we're trying to do and explain me in insurance language what we're trying to achieve right and then i i, yeah. I still audit, edited it a little bit but i made that part of our internal documentation and now i'm just going through our uh, I, I started with insurance because that's one of our um you know typical verticals but there's a number mm -hmm. of verticals for surf so now I'm, I'm doing that one by one so i thought that was a uh, a really good use case to use something like yeah. that yeah yeah that's cool i mean and and otherwise it's uh it's overwhelming uh, with the amount of, you know, if you were going to take that information and create like one pagers for, for conferences or take that information and create an email or have a, you know, subsection or a landing page of your website that's specific to that vertical, um, you know, that's a lot. And so if you have a tool that can help kind of, you know, I like, I like the thought of maybe, you know, you put in the first 10%, the AI handles the middle 80%, and then you handle the last 10%. Like, I like that. It's like, it's like a weird version of the Pareto principle. Um, <laughs> but you've got, you've got the chat GPT doing like the middle 80% of the work. And that's, that's a huge time saver. And it's generally pretty good. Like, you know, with the proper questions and the right language and the right information, um, the results are, are, are pretty good. And you can give it really detailed um, you know, requests for what you want to do. Um, I, I did something similar for our page and kind of coming up with, uh, target personas and, uh, customer avatars and things like that for our business. And, Great. uh, you know, it, it, it was telling me that marketing Mike is, is looking for help with X, Y, Z. And call, we call her marketing. Well, we call that persona marketing, Mary. So free it's marketing, marketing, Mike. Mary, there marketing you go. Mary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got marketing Mike out of, out of chat GPT and, and, uh, but like you can dig into, you know, what are, so for this personas, what's their, what's their greatest fear? What's their, what are the things that they're terrified about? Why, what are the things that they're that are driving them to make decisions. And so you can start asking it some really interesting questions about what might be driving some of the psychological behavior and like motivations of somebody making a purchase. And, um, you know, it's hard to know whether the, the results are accurate or whether they're, you know, true to somebody's like psychological needs. But when I read it, I'm like, okay, yeah, I mean, that sounds that sounds right. Like I can see myself in that person's shoes and think, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm scared to fall behind in technology or I'm scared with joining with a partner that uh, that's going to just take my money and run or they're going to, um, you know, they're not going to give me the service that they promised up front. And, and so, you know, it'll lay all that stuff out, um, which you can then turn into marketing uh, and, and kind mm -hmm. of target those behaviors and those thoughts with 
you know, we're going to solve those problems and not just here's our product, here's what it does. Um, because you know, most people don't buy stuff that way. So, um, yeah, it's, it's cool. It's an amazing tool. You also mentioned mid journey. I've heard several people mention it. Mm -hmm. I haven't had a look at it yet. Is it, is it significantly better to write content? Cause I do find JetGPT, the content it generates can be a little bit generic and dry. Yeah. Um, so mid journey is more of an image creation tool. Um, it's, uh, and it is really oh, sorry, good. Then, then you, you, yeah. yeah, you referred earlier to, to some other tool than my mistake. You yeah. To, I, I can use your tone of I, voice. I yeah. did refer to mid journey, uh, but I'm thinking of it more in the context of, you know, if you're going to build an email or a blog uh -huh. or whatever, um, and you need both to generate, um, an outline or some content. Um, and then generally speaking, you're going to have some kind of imagery to go with it. And so, um, mid journey is a really great tool for that. The weird thing about it though, is that it runs through discord. And so it's a little weird that you have to download like, like a effectively a chat client in discord, uh, and then install the, the mid journey bot. And okay. then you can ask it to do things. Um, but it does, uh, it does a phenomenal job and it, and it's, it craves detail. So you can tell it, in fact, you can use chat GPT to generate a prompt for mid journey um and uh yeah. ha and get its help to get exactly what you're looking for it to create so um it's great but yeah for me for me those are the primary two tools that i use i know there's probably you know millions of other options out there at this point but i'm i'm like you i paid for the for the the fancier access and um you know to have api access and to have chat yeah. gpt4 um and um it's so good. I, I haven't really needed to, to try any of the other tools yet. Awesome. Well, um, before we round up, I was wondering, Aaron, if you have any parting advice, you worked with so many customers, you're you know, taking on new customers. Uh, what is something mm -hmm. a new Salesforce marketing cloud customer should be aware of? What are some like, what's some good advice you can give to avoid some common pitfalls? I think the, the thing that I see happen all the time, um, is that a lot of times a, a client, a, a customer will be looking to replace their CRM and build out marketing cloud and do all that kind of all at the same time. Like they get um, a nice big budget or grant or whatever to go build this thing out. And what I see happen all the time that drives me a little bit crazy is um, a ton of time, effort, and resources will be put into the CRM side of that equation. Um, and then the afterthought is, well, what are we going to do with that information once we get it all centralized? And so, you know, inevitably, you know, marketing cloud or some kind of outbound communication thing is one of the systems that will utilize that CRM data. And so as somebody that works in that space, it's always frustrating when, you know, let's say a company has a million dollar budget, um, you know, they're going to want to spend as close to a million dollars as they can on the CRM. And then they go, oh, yeah, we also want to be able to send emails. And so that ends up being the $10,000 project to the $990,000 CRM project. And it, you know, not to say they should be 50-50, but there definitely should be a lot more investment in the what are you going to do with the data? And in addition to that, I think it's important to consider what are you going to do with the data first? Um, and 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 for a lot of these setups, it's last. It's the the initial investment and time and resources is is spent in what data do we have? Where is it? And how do we structure and organize it so that it's all in the same place? That's effectively what you're doing with the CRM. Yeah. Um, but they're not thinking about what are we going to do with it from there? How are we going to use it? You know, what are our use cases? Um, and, and so I feel like a lot of places get that backwards. They need to, they need to do that first and, and then go work on the data. I think that's very sound advice. I would also second that by saying that, Marketing cloud ultimately is a data-driven product. And so mm -hmm. you do have to start thinking about the data first and then all the good stuff can follow 
if you start with that. Um, Aaron, it's been a mm -hmm. pleasure. It's, uh, again, a great pleasure to to speak with you. I feel there's so much more we can explore, but our time is We could keep today. talking for another hour or two, probably, but yeah. I do think so, <laughs> yes. Well, but thank you for, com uh, for, uh, for being here with us today, and I wish you a great day. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. Thank you for watching Heroes of Marketing Cloud. I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date about future interviews with fellow marketing champions.